There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are always the ways of death. Welcome everyone. Today's subject is the winner of the next episode poll, the one and only Barry the Baron Mills. Born Barry Byron Mills, he would go on to blaze a trail of violence and pain through the California Department of Corrections and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. According to an FBI file, Mills' birthday is August the 26th of 1948, and his place of birth is Salem, Oregon. The physical data listed is height 5'10 and a half, weight 180 pounds, hair brown, eyes blue. Other sources listed Mills' birthday as July 7th, 1948, and Windsor, California as his place of birth. Some of the news articles reporting his death on July 8, 2018, noted that, he noted that he died a day after his birthday. I will go with the FBI info. Mills started kicking up dust at a young age. On June 1, 1964, the sheriff's office reported that 15-year-old Mills, a runaway, used a baseball bat to break nearly every window of a local Windsor home causing several hundred dollars of damage because he was angry. Anger, violence, and doing time will be part of Mills' life from now on. On August the 30th, 1967, Ventura police found Mills asleep in a stolen vehicle. That was not a crime, but the fact that the car was stolen from the Emporium parking lot was a crime. The owner left the keys inside the car when she parked, making it easy pickings for Mr. Mills. He was held in the Ventura jail and then transferred to Sonoma County on the auto theft charge where the crime took place. He was convicted and sentenced to serve a jail term in the Sonoma County Honor Farm. On January the 29th, 1968, Sonoma County jail staff discovered 19-year-old Mills and a buddy, T. Coleman, missing from the Sonoma County Honor Farm at 6.30 a.m. Sonoma County authorities reported Mills' address as 1200 Shiloh Road, Windsor. Sheriff's Deputy Joe Thibodeau arrested Mills and two companions, Gary Walter Adams and Ray McGinnis, in Windsor on February the 17th, 1968, when he pulled over the vehicle the group was riding in to conduct a driver's license check. Mills' partners were charged with aiding and abetting an escapee and sentenced to 30 and 60 days in county jail. Fortunately, the jail time did not temper Mr. Mills' wild ways. On October the 21st, 1968, at 3.30 p.m., teacher Geneva Alicio was leaving her classroom at the Santa Rosa Junior High School when she saw two boys in her brown station wagon pulling away from the curb. She stated she parked her car on King Street right outside of her classroom. The two boys would later be identified as Mills and William Gary Hackworth. At 5.30 p.m., Mills and Hackworth entered the Stewart Point store. Mills pulled out a long-barreled 22 caliber revolver and instructed the store manager, Raymond Burley Young, to lay down on the floor. They took $775 from the register. On the way out, Mills stepped over the manager, took his wallet, checkbook, and hit him over the head with the revolver, opening a gash requiring seven stitches. At the trial, both the store manager and the teacher identified Mills. But the most damning evidence came from his partner. Hackworth turned state evidence and testified against him in the trial. Hackworth told the jury that Mills planned the robbery and that it was also Mills that drove the stolen vehicle. Hackworth pled guilty to first-degree robbery, which carried a sentence of five years to life. But due to his cooperation, Judge Kenneth Iman used the discretion provided to judges by Penal Code 1202B to set the minimum sentence of any person under the age of 23 to 6 months in any conviction other than those requiring the death penalty. On January the 22nd, 1970, after a three-day trial, Mills was convicted of first-degree robbery and car theft. On February the 19th, 1970, he was sentenced to five years to life and was sent to CMF in Vacaville for processing and assignment to a prison facility. Mr. Hackworth feared for his life and his attorney attempted to have his prison sentence suspended and serve a jail time instead, but the prosecutor opposed this. Arrangements were made for Mr. Hackworth to skip Vacaville's reception center and head straight to Dual Vocational Institution. 
When Mills entered the California Department of Corrections in early 1970, the war between the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia was dormant since San Quentin administration, specifically Sergeant Bill Hankins, was not allowing MM members to walk the line at the Big Q. However, it was on between the black and white convict population led by the Black Guerrilla family and the Aryan Brotherhood. The BGF was on the warpath at this time due to the killing of three of their comrades in January of 1970 in Soledad's O-Wing during a confrontation between Brandt and BGF. The gun rail officer fired, fired his rifle four times into the melee, killing three black convicts and wounding AB member Billy Buzzard Harris, causing him to lose a testicle. In December of 1971, a dispute between the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia arose over a homosexual inmate money earner. These types of inmates were referred to as punks or queens. Some could even reach the status of wife or old lady if involved in a consensual exclusive relationship. The owner of the queen, called the Joker in the prison parlance of the white convicts, owed money to both the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia. When he failed to pay his debt, Mexican Mafia member Manuel Buff Perez knocked the Joker out and took the punk with the intention of prostituting her to generate revenue for the clica. The Nuestra Familia felt that they had a stake in the punk as well due to the former owner owing them money too. A compromise was reached and the Nuestra Familia agreed to the MS ownership of the punk except for one newly made familiano. Daniel Woodsy Reyes of Bakersfield. He did not want to yield to the Mafia and kept disputing the issue. On April 4th, things came to a head when M. Carnales, Philip Black Segura, Raymond Chavo Perez, and Manuel Chita Padilla attacked N. Familianos, Woodsy Reyes, and Death Row Joe Gonzalez. The Familia retaliated on April the 10th of 1972 when Frank Joker Mendoza Stab mafioso Louis Million Dollar Lou Valenzuela. The resumption of the hostilities had begun. By this time, Mills, now known as the Baron, was tipped up with the Aryan Brotherhood and was not going to sit on the sidelines. That was in his style. In June of 1972, the Baron was housed at Dual Vocational Institution, and the war between the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia was in full swing. The A.B. notched the first murder when Fred Mendren killed Mosca Castillo at Palm Hall in April of 1972. On July 2, 1972, the Nuestra Familia tried moving on Mafia member Richard Baby Boy Resendez, a CYA ward at DVI, but he took the knife away and killed NF member Gonzalo Huero Lopez. On July 3, 1972, the very next day, N.F. Carnal Jesse Bozo Castro of Chula Vista was stabbed to death in the DVI dining room while eating dinner. DVI administration reported that Bozo stumbled out of the dining room at about 6 p.m. with three knife wounds in his back and neck. He died a short time later. A nine-inch knife with a cloth-wrapped handle was recovered. No one was ever prosecuted for this murder, and it remains unsolved, but the convicts who knew who's who in the zoo credited this murder to the Baron and an with an assist from MM member Martin Keto Vargas. As the years rolled by, the AB and the BGF continued their conflict. On Sunday, May the 25th, 1975, at approximately 10.15 a.m., Aryan Brotherhood member Richard Turflinger of El Monte was exercising outside his cell on the third tier of the Maximum Security San Quentin Adjustment Center when he was stabbed in the face and body by Black Gorilla family member Garland Berry. Turflinger was treated and reported in good condition in the prison hospital. This was the 14th stabbing of the year in San Quentin. Garland was not prosecuted and would be paroled. On Friday, April the 22nd, 1977, Garland Berry returned to San Quentin after violating his parole by participating in a mail fraud scheme. Of course, the AB was immediately made aware of his arrival. On April the 25th, 1977, shortly before 8 a.m., Garland Berry, along with other newly arrived convicts, were crossing the yard on their way back to North Block after eating breakfast. 
At this point, Garland Barry was attacked by two white convicts. The attackers wielded 11-inch knives and stabbed Garland Barry in the back, chest, face, and leg, killing him. A guard on the catwalk broke up the assault by firing a warning shot. One of the attackers was stabbed in the buttocks and taken to the prison hospital. Another assailant was identified as an Aryan Brotherhood member. Prison officials did not release their names. A prison spokesman said that due to Garland Berry's past as a troublemaker and his involvement in at least two assaults on white convicts during his prior term at San Quentin, he was asked upon his arrival if he expected any problems. He said he did not. It is said that the Baron was the brand member that carried out this murder in retaliation for the Turk Flinger stabbing in 1975, but I am not so sure. Before I can explain why, I must discuss another crime involving Barry Mills. In early June of 1976, AB members The Baron, Daniel D.C. Cavanaugh, and Billy Buzzard Harris were out on Broadway having paroled. The Baron's Mexican Mafia crime partner, Martin Queto Vargas, had also paroled. In early June of 1976, Mills, D.C., and Queto traveled to Lake Havasu, Arizona to visit a female friend of the Baron's named Debbie Kinney. Miss Kinney observed D.C. was driving a 1968 Oldsmobile Cutlass. On the night of June 7, 1976, the Baron, D.C., Buzzard, and Queto met at Kearney Park. Buzzard testified for the prosecution that D.C. said they were going to rob the Queen. When he asked D.C. what he meant, D.C. said that they were going to rob the Lloyd's Bank of London tomorrow. Buzzard refused to participate in the bank robbery. On June 8, 1976, the Baron and Keto entered the Mayfair branch of the Lloyd's Bank in Fresno, California. D.C. Cavanaugh waited outside in the getaway vehicle, the 1968 Oldsmobile Cutlass. All three were wearing masks. Keto showed a badge and a gun to the bank manager and forced him to the vault. Keto next directed the Baron to follow them and bring the bag in which they put the stolen $111,500. They quickly exited the bank and jumped in the getaway vehicle. The crew then began purchasing goods with their ill-gotten gains. Ketel bought a 1949 Packard for $2,500 the same day of the robbery. Two days after the robbery, the Baron purchased a pickup camper in Las Vegas. Miss Kinney testified that the Baron came out to see her again after the bank robbery and showed her a briefcase containing a large amount of money wrapped in white bands. When she asked him where it came from, the Baron told her, from a job I did. You'll have to read about it in the newspapers. The Baron went on to tell her that there was $35,000 in the briefcase, which represented a three-way split. On the same day, the Baron bought the pickup camper in Vegas. D.C. Kavanaugh's wife paid $3,000 for a Pontiac. Shortly thereafter, D.C. and his wife tried crossing into Canada and Niagara Falls. $19,000 in cash and two firearms were found on the couple. The pair was arrested and D.C. initially gave a fake name but slipped up when he signed the booking slip with his real name. When confronted, D.C. said he was wanted by the feds for a Fresno bank robbery. He told the deputy that he could make himself $19,000 richer by just taking the money. In a side note, D.C.'s attorney convinced a federal judge that D.C. won the money playing craps in Vegas. The money was released to the defense attorney, which he kept as payment for his services. The final piece of evidence fell into place when an FBI agent was on his way to work when he observed Ghetto's father driving the getaway vehicle. On December 30, 1976, all three were convicted. The Baron asked for an immediate sentencing and received a 20-year federal sentence. Now with that in place, let's return to the murder of BGF member Garland Berry on April 25, 1977. As noted earlier, the Baron was convicted and sentenced on December 30, 1976 for the bank robbery, making it highly unlikely that he was incarcerated at San Quentin on April 25, 1977, nearly four months later. Is it possible he was held at San Quentin awaiting transfer to the feds or subpoenaed there by another AB member? 
Yes, it is possible. But without any corroborating information, I do not believe the Baron was present at San Quentin on the day that Garland Barry was murdered. I believe it was another AB member. But let us continue with the Baron's story. Near the end of April of 1979, John Sherman Marsloff was transferred from USP Leavenworth to USP Atlanta. He had burned AB Federal Commissioner Thomas Terrible Tom Severstein in a heroin transaction. After that, fearing that he would be killed, Marsloff requested a transfer. Silverstein put out a contract on Marsloff and sent word to the Baron in Atlanta asking him to take care of him. On May 20th, 1979, Marsloff was killed in the men's restroom of a recreation shack at USP Atlanta. His death was caused by 16 stab wounds in the head, back, shoulder, and upper arm area. The murder weapon was tossed into a toilet. A second similar knife unused in the killing was tucked up under Marsloff's arm. Although numerous witnesses testified of having seen Mills in the area, the only witness was Danny Holliday. Holliday, the prosecution's key witness, testified that he had accompanied Mills to the recreation shack armed with the second knife for the sole purpose of robbing Marsloff. He said he was surprised by the murder and had taken no part in it. Included in the prosecution's evidence supporting their assertion that Mills was a member of the brand was a letter Mills had written from prison to another member that was intercepted. In the letter, Mills refers to Aryan Brotherhood activities and his participation in other crimes. A portion of that letter was contained in the court documents. It reads as follows. All right, brother. How are you doing? As for me, all's the same program, just in a different neighborhood. Presently, I'm doing a two-year program here at Marion in the control unit. Yeah, they gave me a couple bogus 187s down in Atlanta. Nothing they've been able to take me to court on yet. I did just get through with an assault trial at Leavenworth. We fought it ourselves and ended up with a hung jury. So I'm now waiting to see if the U.S. attorney that way is going to file for a retrial. A few of us have swore off burnt spoons this way. We have a couple of new kids this way that we need to sit and rap about. We have asked you fellas to trust our judgment on new kids this way as we trust your judgment that way. It's just that sending names through the mail only puts the bottles on top of folks they need not be. Tommy and I will stand accountable this way and all will stay in top order. I understand that Arizona is sending about 10 fellas this way that are, that are claiming brand. Has anyone been able to get to the bottom of the story on that trip on Arizona? I've got a homeboy that way now and I'm attempting to find out how all that came about that way. If I end up going to trial down in Atlanta and, if, and it does look like I will be shortly, do you want me to call you? I called Baby out to my last trial at Leavenworth. What I'd like to do is call you, someone from the Bay, someone from Palm Hall, and I was thinking along the lines of you, Buff, and Rick. We do need to just sit and wrap a spell. Let me know your thoughts on that. Miriam seems to be becoming home base for the M and us. About 10 of them out this way. What's the story on things between them and us? I myself hope with all my heart things can be worked out with respect to all, as only the bottles can gain in any other way. Keep us posted. Well, I'll hush my mouth for now and fold this on up. My love to kin and friends. An assault trial that I was not familiar with was also mentioned in the letter. However, after some research, I found the pertinent information. In 1978, Terrible Tom Silverstein started serving a 15-year sentence in the United States Penitentiary at Leavenworth for bank robbery. In February of 1979, Leavenworth inmate Danny Atwell was murdered and Silverstein was charged with this crime. On January the 14th, 1980, the trial began in the United States District Court in Topeka, Kansas. Prior to the trial commencing, Silverstein subpoenaed the Baron who was now housed in Marin's control unit and another unidentified brand member. The Baron and the other member arrived at Leavenworth on January the 1st, 1980. They were being escorted to Leavenworth's control unit for security reasons when the unidentified AB member kicked one of the escorting guards in the knee. 
while at the same time the Baron attacked another guard, breaking his glasses and knocking out one of the guard's teeth. Silverstein was convicted at, of the Otwell murder, however the conviction was overturned and he was not retried for the murder. The Baron was not so lucky. He was convicted of the Marsloff murder on November the 13th, 1981 and was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences on December the 14th of 1981. The life sentences were to run consecutively to the 20-year sentence the Baron was serving for the Fresno bank robbery. His crime partner in the Mosloff murder, Danny Holliday, who turned state's evidence, pled to a lesser charge on December the 18th of 1980 of conspiracy to commit armed robbery on a government reservation. On December the 21st, 1981, Holliday was sentenced to three years. Well, we'll have to end it here for now as this episode is already very lengthy. We will pick this up in another video, but for now, good night and God bless.